This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. Dr. John Deloney, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today as we answer your questions about your relationships, your mental health, your work, you, your money. This is a show about your life. It's called The Ramsey Show, but it's all about you. The phone number here is 888-825-5225. That's 888-825-5225. As we celebrate Baby Steps Millionaires being number one book in the nation, uh, John, I think it's a good idea to stop and pause and remind people that uh, very, very few people become wealthy being crooks. Most people build wealth by steady saving and by being good people, people of character. I disagree, Dave. I heard that on the news that evil people are also rich people and vice versa. You read that in the in the newspaper, did you? Yeah. Because <laughs> everything that's on the news or the internet or the, the newspaper true, is right? absolutely true. So you're telling me, Dave, that there are people who have worked and saved and provided value to their communities and to their country and to their neighbors, and they have money too? It turns out that that is the the statistically um, significant most high probability of becoming wealthy is providing service. Because if you feed somebody one hamburger and you make a dollar, um, you made a dollar and they got a hamburger and they're happy. They got a hamburger in their belly. And um, if you feed some, I'll tell you a guy I talked to the other day, our team talked to, I didn't talk to him, is the guy that started the company Jelly Bellies. Oh, Those hey. gourmet jelly beans. Oh, I know what they are. He's brought a lot of joy <laughs> to people. Now, he's 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 an evil rich person right? by selling and giving great joy with jelly beans <laughs> to a lot of people. And uh, I'm telling you, man, I, I I don't know who the gummy bear guy is, but you hey, personally jelly, have been served by him. Jelly bellies. I don't know if I've been served I'm not sure who the them. donut guy is, <laughs> but I've been served by him. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Cream. Yeah, uh, of the uh, Krispy Kreme uh, right. Foundation. Yeah, first thank name. you. Yeah, we support that foundation, <laughs> and uh, or the Duncan, Mr. Uh, Duncan, either one. I love but the, Jelly uh, Bellies. Oh man! Oh. So hey, here's the thing: if you provide service uh, to one person, you're going to make one dollar or one amount of money. If you preside, provide service to millions of people, you're going to make millions mm-hmm. of dollars, and you didn't steal any of it. Right. Evil rich people is a bunch of crap. Mm-hmm. It's a lie. Yeah. Here's an example. My friend Mark Cuban, and um, I can actually dial Mark's phone number, and he actually will answer. We have very short conversations because he and I are just alike. We don't talk on the phone. Hey, but, what? See ya. Huh, Bye. Well, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Done. No. I email him sometimes, and he emails me back. No. Yep. Or maybe later. We'll talk later or something, you know, that kind of stuff. So big, big, deep, in, in-depth relationship. <laughs> but... Uh, um, but he has, uh, to, to, to his credit, he, billionaire, this from, uh, this on NPR, oh God, uh, billionaire investor and Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban has launched an online pharmacy for generic drugs that promises steep discounts over traditional distributors. The Mark Cuban Cost Plus Drug Company announced opening its online pharmacy Wednesday. The pharmacy says it will bypass the healthcare industry middlemen and help consumers avoid high drug prices by charging manufacturers prices plus a flat 15% markup and pharmacist fee. All drugs are priced at cost plus 15%. Sign up and share your thoughts and experiences with us, Cuban tweeted last week. Cuban's Pharmacy says it will negotiate drug prices directly with manufacturers to lower its costs for consumers. One drug for diabetes patients sells for $3.90 for a 30-day supply compared for retail at $20.00. A 30 count of, um, I can't pronounce it, which is used to treat leukemia and other cancers, goes for as low as $17.10 at Cuban's Pharmacy, compared to $2,500 instead of $17 Hmm. at other pharmacies. Now, Cuban's going to make another billion doing this, and he will have helped millions and millions of people 
get drugs for $17 instead of $2,500. What's evil about this? So, it, it, you literally have a billionaire here that, uh, that, by looking at this article, looks like he is attempting to provide a public good. Somebody who says, I've got the money and resources. I'm sick of people I know who have lesser, less, less economic uh, buying power than I do not being able to afford their drug, I'm solving this problem. And I'm going to make a lot of money. Why Why is that? Uh, I don't understand the opposing force there. There, yeah, it's, it's um, if I'm happy, you can't be because you took up, because I took up all the happiness. Yeah, it's like there's a some zero like there's game a fi- on like happiness it's a fixed or joy. Pie. Yeah. It's a fixed pie. If you make a bunch of money, that means someone else didn't. That's not how money works. Oh, man. Rabbi Lappin says money is more like candles than cake. Hmm. If you get a big slice of cake, that means someone else gets a smaller slice? No, that's not how money works. So he, It's more like candles. When you light a candle, your candle is not diminished, and you light another candle, and you light another candle, and you light another candle, and then you got Christmas Eve service. Oh, huh. So this is Mark Cuban's. Here's, a, here's something that just happened just a few minutes ago. Um, I went and did a talk with a guy who owns a couple of car dealerships in Kentucky. And met with his team. Around the tornado. Right. It was right around the tornado. He asked me to come up there, talk about crisis, talk about stuff. Talk about trauma. Talk about trauma and how do we move past this. And his first time his group got back together. And as a part of that conversation, I was asking individual people, what are they, what's, what's something that's real and tangible that's going on in your life right now? Somebody stood up and talked about a problem with their home. They don't have a home. Yeah. And um, they just bought a new home and then a, a sale of their old home fell through. It was just a mess. And this owner quietly said, he called his wife and said, I'm going to buy a house today. And I, I, he didn't elaborate further. He ended up buying that house and said, I'm going to find something good to do with this house. And thought, I'll flip it, whatever. Then somebody in this, in, when the tornadoes came through, he was able to provide housing for a family that's been displaced and now has the idea of, I'm going to keep this thing indefinitely. I can just use this to serve because people need a place to stay, whether it's two months, five months, one year, and now I've got an opportunity to help them. And that's a 30-year game of somebody who's been a, stewarding their money, taking care of their people, has got a heart of a servant, and now has the resources to say, I'm going to help you, and I'm going to help them. I'm going to serve my community. And no one will ever know this happened because he's, he's not a billionaire Mark Cuban. He just owns a couple of car dealerships in a small community that just got wiped out by tornadoes, and he's able to help. Right, he didn't have to call a government. Doesn't have to call any. Cert- He's able to help, and the, the those stories go untold day after day, minute by minute, all across this country, man. So it, the the data actually says that when your moron friend or family member says rich people are evil, the data actually says that your friend or relative is a moron. That they're wrong. <laughs> That's what the data says. It says that guy's a moron. He's just wrong, and he doesn't know what he's talking about. He has no first-hand knowledge. He has no data to back this up, because the actual data says that there are no more evil people among rich people than there are among poor people. Turns out there's jerks that have money, and there's jerks that don't. And there's good people that have money, and good people that don't. This is The Ramsey Show. Chaos. That's what it can feel like when your business is growing so fast you've outgrown your financial and accounting software. The faster you grow, the more likely you are to lose control of the numbers. And here's the reality. If you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. That's why we use NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. Over 28,000 companies use NetSuite by Oracle, including Ramsey Solutions, because NetSuite gives us a single view of everything we need to make daily decisions. Whether you're making a few million to hundreds of millions, a year, NetSuite gives you the visibility and control of the things you need to grow, like your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and more, all in one dashboard. Go to NetSuite.com slash Ramsey right now to get their free white paper, Jumpstart Your CFO Career.
Dr. John Deloney, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Logan and Kelly are with us in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I see on my screen you guys are debt-free. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're so excited to be on the phone with you. You too. Well done. How much debt have you paid off? We paid off 29,011 months. Good for you. And your range of income during that time? We actually, most people go up in income. We kind of went down because we moved from Indiana to Mississippi. So we went from about 95,000 to now 70,000 as my wife is just working part-time right now. Very cool. Good. What do you guys do for a living? I'm a surgical technologist. Mm -hmm. And I'm a student pastor. Okay, very good. And what kind of debt was your 29,000? The debt was all my college loans. So when Kelly and I got married, she was completely debt-free and I was not. Ah, okay. All right. So you married up. (laughs) I did. I I, I married rich. (laughs) It's a good thing. Oh, so tell us the story. What happened that put you guys on this journey 11 months ago, plugging into Ramsey? Well, I really what happened was when we were preparing to get married, as she didn't have any debt, she kind of kicked my butt into into go mode, and and we had to, she said that we weren't going to have any debt, and I agreed with her. I had taken your class before. We actually now just taught financial peace, and so really it was just, you know, deciding that we were going to make the decision to become debt-free. Yeah. We both were working full-time jobs and doing side gigs. We did DoorDash, and Logan officiated. Um, Just did anything to attack the debt. I love it. Well done, guys. That's Proud fan- of you. Yeah, that's Thank fantastic. Thank you so much. What was the hardest part as a married couple or as a dating couple, married new, newlyweds? What was the hardest part about this? The hardest part for me was, you know, like <clears throat> I know a lot of males do, is I kind of felt, I felt bad like I was bringing in baggage to our marriage. Mm-hmm. And as we were dating, you know, preparing to get married, I didn't want to be that type of husband that was, of course, you know, I, no one wants to pull their spouse down. And I definitely didn't want to be weighing my wife down with debt. Hmm. To me, I think the hardest part was just not spending. Um, when we get married, I am the spender in the rela- relationship, although I didn't have debt. Um, it was just hard for me to get married and not be able to spend. So, but it was so worth it now that we, now that we paid it off. Wow. Way to go, guys. Very cool. All right, so you're teaching Financial Peace University. You paid off your debt. You really did it. And they ask, uh, hey, Pastor, how you, how'd you pay off $29,000? What do you tell them the secret is? We tell them the secret, of, of course, is to first pay, you know, your tithes. That was a big, we never wavered on our tithes. So that was first. And then the second Good. was you just have to attack it. Do anything. Focus on it. Yeah, focus on it. And, you know, be intentional with your money and ensure that, you're not just falling into lies that it can't be done because it's a, it's a big dollar amount. Yeah. Constantly, I'd be like, okay, how much debt are we at? Like, it was just like a constant weekly thing or daily thing. You know, we were just constantly focusing on it. Yeah. Wow. Way to go, guys. Very Thank cool. You so much. It's a big deal. That intentionality is everything. And there is something that happens uh, that God understands and we don't. That says when we give first... Uh, and we live a second, it means we trust him, that something happens in our spirit, something happens in the universe, something happens in God's law, and we just see things unfold to our benefit. It's very real. So if you live like no one else later, you can live and give like no one else, but we're giving at least a baseline of the tithe all the way through, and that's what our lessons have always taught, too. So very good, guys. Very well done. And so you're going to be a student pastor, is that right? A camp- are you a campus pastor? I'm actually I'm full time at a church. Okay, yes, we're student pastors now. So, how are you going to teach and educate students on their transition into college after going through what you just went through? That's a great question. One of the things that I try and do as a student pastor is provide a lot of practical teaching, um, and then implement on implementation skills on how they can do that. Um, and you know, I teach tithing and teach. I try and teach them now to save and uh, to prepare for college or whatever their next um, route takes them because life comes hard sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I encourage is that, and at the church, is that they take a financial piece together before they get married. Love it. And just working with our young adults ministry so that they ensure 
Are you teaching are, are you teaching high school teens? I teach high schoolers, yes. How many high schoolers in the group? We have about 80 students. Wow. Way to go. That's awesome, man. Cool. Hey, I want you to recommend to them that they watch Borrowed Future, uh, the documentary okay. that we did on the uh, epic failure of student loan debt. I'm going to send you a case of Anthony O'Neill's book, Debt-Free Degree, for your high schoolers so they can go get debt-free degrees. And wow, also, thank you so much. We're thank also you. going to give you a copy of Baby Steps Millionaires because that's the next step or the next chapter in your story as you move on and continue to be heroes in what you're doing. I'm so proud of you guys. Well done. Thank you both so much. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. All right, count it down. Logan and Kelly, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Wow, 29000 paid off in 11 months is how they start their married life. I love it. Ding, ding. Making 95 down to now 70 with a move. Count it down. Let's hear a debt-free scream. Three, two, one. We're debt-free. Yeah. yeah. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Well done. Very well done. Good stuff. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Well, the last couple of years have been tough. They've been tough on relationships. They've been tough on people's mental health. They've been tough on business and economics. They've been tough on finances. Tough on marriages. You, your spouse, the kids have been cooped up in quarantine, juggling online school, work from home. Maybe you've thrown in a job loss or a job change, and all that chaos is sucking up all of your bandwidth, all your time, your energy. You lost focus on the real issues in your marriage, your money, your intimacy, your parenting, your communication. The good news is with the right tools, these challenges can bring you back to your spouse and make you guys even closer than before. So Rachel Cruz and Dr. John Deloney to my right are back to talk about in a fan talk talk about how to do all this in a fan favorite event the money and marriage live stream valentine's edition on friday february the 11th rachel cruz and dr deloney will walk you and your spouse through the five keys to unlock your stronger marriage in 2022 the marriage live, money live streams on sale right now starts today only 20 bucks go to ramseysolutions.com slash events to learn more john this event has always been a huge event yeah yeah, it's been a huge event, and um, it's 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 a savior for couples because for twenty bucks you can cuddle up on the couch. You don't have to go make reservations and get out in the mess. You can sit at home, and we really make it easy for you to have some good conversations with your spouse and to get closer and better connected, or to decide, hey, we got some healing we got to do. It's got good. Some, got some work to do. That's right. Yeah. yeah so it's and a Rachel's, Valentine's, Rachel's Valentine's class. Yeah, Valentine's Day date night. Dr. John Deloney. Uh, RamseySolutions.com, and uh, again, it's our uh, annual money and marriage live stream. Only twenty bucks. Go over there and get signed up, and and make that a date night on the eleventh. That's a Friday night. And one thing is for sure, if Deloney and Rachel Cruz are there, you will be laughing. There's gonna be some chaos. That's right. There will be some chaos. You will be laughing. It will be fun and funny. It will not be accidental. This is gonna work. You're gonna you're gonna learn stuff, but you're also going to just have an entertaining evening. These guys are both world-class communicators and both world-class with the content and things they're going to bring to you. So the Money and Marriage live stream on sale now, only $20. And for you Ramsey Plus members, uh, if you're already a member of Ramsey Plus, you have free access to this event, part of your membership. If you're not a Ramsey Plus member, again, it's only 20 bucks. So uh, get the early bird rate. Get your event pass today or jump on Ramsey Plus. Go ahead and join and get the Financial Beach University started and you can get this Valentine's Day Money and Marriage live stream as part of the package. Not a bad idea. RamseySolutions.com slash events. This is the Ramsey Show.
still on baby step number one, eh? How'd you guess? With health care costs rising, learn how Christian Healthcare Ministries can help you make the most out of your budget. Visit chministries.org slash budget. Don't worry, it's worth it. Ramsey personality is my co-host today as we answer your questions about your life and your money. Landon and Micah are with us in the lobby of Ramsey Solutions on the debt-free stage to do a debt-free scream. Hey, guys. Welcome. Hey, Dave. How's, how's it going? Good to have you guys. I'm honored to have you. How much debt have you paid off? We paid about $132,000. Whoa. <laughs> How long did this take? It took about 11 months. 11 months. Very impressive. And your range of income during that time? Well, we started about $40,000, and then we went up to about $280,000. That's not a bad jump in a year. <laughs> Somebody got a raise, <laughs> you think? <laughs> oh, my gosh. What do you guys do for a living now? So I work for a pro-life organization mm -hmm. as a continuum care coordinator. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm a turf and pest control technician, but I also started a uh, car small carpentry business during that time, which is where the 280 came from. Okay. That turned into not so small. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, everybody's going crazy in construction. Uh, it's just wild out there. Absolutely. So you, you caught a wave, man. Very What's good. What's your carpentry yeah. skill? Uh, pretty much anything you need, but mostly just furniture and stuff like that. Wow. Oh, you're building fine, fine. Mm -hmm. fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Very neat. Yeah, that's where some money can come in. Excellent. Excellent. Ooh. excellent. Look at you guys. <laughs> Very fun. So what started this journey 11 months ago? Uh, so, I mean, I wish we had like this huge climactic moment where like we had this major turnaround, um, but it really just didn't happen that way. Um, I was homeschooled my whole life, and um, my mom basically crammed your program down our throats as part of our schooling <laughs> uh, for our entire homeschooling lives. And so, you know, it's really just always been in my head. You don't get a credit card. You don't get a car payment. You don't get any kind of debt. And so, you know, I mean, I just grew up never having any kind of debt. Um, and but so, you did. What was the 132000 That was our house. Oh, you paid Whoa! off your house. Yep. Yep. Lead Look with at that weird next time. people. Yep, Woo! for sure. <laughs> you got to wow. lead with that one. You have a, how old are y'all? Uh, I'm, I'm 20, 24. I'm 25. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Dude. 280000 a year at 24 and 25 years old with a paid-for house. What's this house worth? Uh, about 185 Way to go, mom cramming it down your throat. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You're yeah. on your way to be millionaires in no time. Appreciate You're amazing. It. Wow. Appreciate it. Very cool. So you got, how long have you been married? Uh, about just three over and a half. Th yeah, three and a half years. Okay, so three and a half years, and you bought a house, and then 11 months ago you said... Paint it off. Yeah, well, we actually found out that we were having our first baby, and so we basically said to ourselves, uh, you know, what would life be like if we could have our first kid and not have a payment in the world? Um, and so we basically just kind of said challenge accepted and said that we wanted to be the last Twisdales. It, <laughs> shoot, why am I crying? <laughs> Because you broke your family tree, man. You we, completely changed We basically changed said it. that we wanted to be the last Twisdales. Ever in debt. In this, in this part of the family tree that it was ever a slave to the lender. Yeah. I love that. Shit, why I am I crying? That. Because it's awesome. Because it's amazing. <laughs> because we, yeah, I we, promised myself I wasn't going to you that. Do some, when you do something that breaks the mold, yeah, yeah, your body feels it, man. That's that amazing. That is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> how many couples get pregnant and say... How 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 much can we doll up the, the this this one pound humans or the ten pound humans room right and let's add all these trinkets and stuff and you guys said what if we set this kid up for a life that's not going to know the stress the anxiety the the rattling that goes on you guys did it you yeah. did it man <laughs> wow you wow. did literally change your family tree you're 24 and 25 you're amazing <laughs> you're amazing it's so impressive so what was the hardest impressive. part about this journey. I think for me, it was the nights and days that we didn't really see each other because of work. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, it was it was 18 hours a day, six days a week, uh, grinding all the time. So, uh, I think the hardest part definitely, I mean, other than that, had to be just the relentless physical labor. Um, 
you know, just till, I mean, you know, till 5 a.m., 48 hours straight sometimes, 60 hours straight with no sleep sometimes. Um, I mean, I would drive all the way to Nashville to deliver some pieces, drive to Little Rock to deliver some pieces. Um, it's just nonstop, all the time, grinding. Yeah. Wow. But ding, you brought in some serious cash. Man. Yep. Yep. And you can do anything for a short period of time. Yeah, for now sure. You work like no one else. Now you can work like no one else. That's exactly right. <laughs> now, now you'll get the furniture when I'm through with it. That's, that's right. After <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I get done holding my little baby for as long as I want. To. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. And you guys, that's so cool. Very cool. Well, obviously, hard work is a big part of your equation. And uh, I love your mom homeschooling, cramming this stuff down your throat. And now here he stands as a young dad. Yeah. Not a payment. Yeah, we would literally be on the way to Disney World on vacations. And we would be watching the videos on the little small TVs that would be used to be in the vans and stuff. We'd be watching the videos on the way to Disney World, having to take notes and everything. Little kids having to watch Dave Ramsey. Oh, God help them. <laughs> so there's counseling needed for that. Oh, oh man. man. In the man. van. In the van. I mean, other kids watch. Watching Little Mermaid, he gets to watch Dave Ramsey. <laughs> oh man, wow! So Pretty well, amazing. Well, how y'all have friends who've been married for a few years too? When you hear the struggles they're going through and the, how their marriage is going and how it's not, go- how would you stack your marriage up against theirs? And I, and I know you shouldn't compare these kind of things. I'm asking you to compare these kind well, of things. Well, we've actually been having, ever since we did this, we've had a lot of conversations with people our age um, just because they want to know how we did it and stuff like that. And just hearing situations that people our age are in or um, I mean, voluntarily put themselves in, um, it's pretty wild, you know, the stories we've heard. Because, you know, growing up like we did, you know, I just thought that every, I mean, I thought everybody paid cash for cars. I mean, mm-hmm. why would you not pay cash for a car? Yeah. Um, you know, and so it was weird, Um hearing these different stories of different situations. Um, and I was even reading Baby Steps Millionaires yesterday and reading the data in the back of the book. And I was telling her, I was like, the average millionaire on here paid their house off at like 50. I think we're all right. <laughs> you, you are more than all right, my friend. Yeah. You are more than all right, my yeah, friend. You're, you're, 50, you'll be there, you're going to be there by 32. You're going to be the guy that your kid calls you and says, I got a buddy who really needs some help. And you can say, tell them to meet me at coffee. And sure. we'll be able to bless them in a way that they don't even know what's coming, right? For sure. Yeah, you, oh, true. my gosh, man. That's oh, incredible. Very I, neat. How inspirational, man. So uh, what do you tell people the key to getting out of debt is? I would say to find people that will encourage you throughout the whole process and be there for you. Uh, I would say I, I think it's the most obvious but the most difficult thing of the entire thing, and that's never giving up. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because I think everybody goes through storms from all the hundreds of debt-free st- screams that I've listened. Somebody went through storms in the middle of it, and we did. I mean, we had one month where her car locked up, the engine locked up, the heat and air went out, and she had medical bills from the pregnancy. It's about $14,000 a month in bills. Wow. Um, stuff like that makes you want to give up. I'm, I'll tell you what. Mm-hmm. But, but instead of giving up in the middle of a storm, we would just ask ourselves, what could we accomplish in the rain? Mm-hmm. And so I, I think the key would be to never give up. Mm-hmm. Great song. Great song title. I like it. Wow. What can we accomplish in the rain? Good stuff, man. <laughs> oh, wait, dude. I hope. It's a stud. I'm unbelievable. If you listen to this show for five minutes, you know that I'm rarely speechless. And I don't, the words aren't coming. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't have, I, I just hope people are listening to this. You got a young couple who decided we're going to get on the same page. We're going to have a singular goal. I'm not going to take tired for an answer for a short period of time. This isn't sustainable, but I'm going to do it for a short period of yeah. time for that little bundle of joy I'm looking yeah. at right over there. We're going to go through storms. We're going to figure out who we are in the midst of madness. We're going to keep going, keep going, mm-hmm. never give up, never give up. So, and you've changed it all, man. Yeah. Michael, you said you the support was everything. Who are your cheerleaders that are here with you? It's definitely our family. Mm-hmm. Um, they have been there through it all. And mm-hmm. um, yeah. Our who all, who all's with you? This is my parents, my siblings, her parents, her grandparents. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's it. Oh, and, and my brother-in-law and nephews. Yep. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So is that your grandparents I met from South America? Yes. Mm-hmm. All right. Yes. Very cool. Yep. Very cool. Wow. Wow. We're so honored, you guys. What a neat story. Do you want to hold your little ones? Yeah. Yeah, I'll bring him in there. <laughs> I got the headphones What's on. What's his name? Lucas. 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 Way to go, sure. Lucas. All right. Well, we may, hopefully you won't wake him up. It's a new, up. new baby. <laughs> yes, Brand one new. month. Oh, Brand wow. New. 11 months they did it. A house and everything. $132,000 paid off. 24 and 25 years old with a paid for house. Making 40 to 280. I ain't saying tired. I'm getting it done. Landon and Micah from Memphis. Count it down. Let's hear a debt-free scream. Three, Three two, two, one. one. We're debt-free! Yeah. 
Lucas never moved. Never flinched. <laughs> yes. So cool. Yes. Wow. Powerful. This is the Ramsey Show. John Deloney, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Amy is in Dallas, Texas. Hi, Amy. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Mr. Ramsey. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? <laughs> um, I got two quick questions. So first one is, does it really matter if I invest in real estate or mutual funds? Because I'd really rather not be a landlord. You do not have to invest in real estate. No. <laughs> okay, so it's pretty much the same. Okay, so then the second question is, um, should I roll over my traditional 401k to a Roth 401k? Basically, I already asked my company if they would do it, and they said no, but should I push that, or is that like probably something that they just don't offer? Uh, they probably don't have a choice, but no, you should not do it. Unless you're on Baby Step Seven and have extra money. Oh, I, I am on Baby Step Seven for oh, sure. Oh, you are. Okay. And I have, I, I can, I can take the. the you can take the time. How much? How much is in your I traditional? Okay. Um, four hundred in mine and about three hundred in my husband, so seven hundred total. Thousand dollars. Yes, sir. Okay, so your tax bill is three hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, and I don't know if I, I could probably piece know that you know each year. So basically, a little more background. I'm thirty two. Net worth of around $2 million, maybe step seven. House is paid for, obviously. Baby step yes, seven. Yeah. yeah, I would roll it. I would roll it to a Roth, and I'd certainly not put anything in the Roth in anything, in, in any traditional going forward. Your company offers a Roth, but they will not, they're not offering the option for you to roll your traditional portion into the Roth portion. Correct. And I, yeah, I mean, I, 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 think, might, you I, I, I think you can push that. I think you can push that. That's, that's technically allowable. And I'm not right. positive that they technically can deny you doing that. Okay. Once they okay. offer, once they offer a Roth, if they don't offer a Roth oh, 401k, do yeah. they def- then they could obviously started- say, "Well, we don't have that available." But if they've got it available to Roth do, like, see, I've got a Roth here. Let me give you an example of how I know that. Okay, I've got a Roth here at the company, at my mm-hmm. company, and the matching portion has to be traditional. But I every year roll the matching portion after the match is given to me into the Roth portion, and I pay the taxes on it. Right. I heard that. So that's why I was like, huh, interesting idea. Yeah. So you can do that <laughs> if you want to do that. Now, uh, your company, his company, both, if they both have Roth I, Roth 401ks available, I, I, I'm not, I can't tell you for sure that they have to. Uh, we know technically they can because they, it's available to you. Um, and I'm not sure they technically, by regulation, can deny you doing that. I think they just don't want to screw with it. So walk me through the math on that, Dave. So if I've got 700 grand and I, in traditional, I roll it to a Roth, I've got to pay taxes on that. You've got to pay taxes. So it's going to cut it in half. It's gonna, you're not going to take the money out. You're going to take 300K from somewhere else. And pay the taxes. Okay. And then that 700K is going to grow tax-free from now on. So mathematically, mm-hmm. it's as if you put another 300 into your traditional. Because you're going to pay taxes on it at If some you point. had put the 300 you paid in taxes uh-huh. into this one, right? it would have grown enough. The 700, now a million, mm-hmm. would have grown to enough to pay the taxes on the traditional. Okay. So it's, it has the same mathematical effect as an additional 300,000 being invested into your 
uh, into your four hundred one k because you're paying the taxes on the side. Wow. And you don't okay. do that stuff till you get to baby step seven, though. Okay. Because you need that other money if you, you, your you house wouldn't use that three hundred k if you had mortgage. You right, wouldn't okay. use that three hundred k if you had other debt. Okay. You know, so you're a baby step seven though, and she's two million dollar net worth at thirty two years old. Ding ding. Oh. Another baby steps millionaire. They're everywhere out mm. there. They're everywhere. Christine is with us. Christine's in St. Louis. Hi, Christine. How are you? I am very thankful to be talking with both of you today. Thank you for taking my call. Certainly. How can we help? Well, I'm living a country song, so I'm hoping you might be able to give me some ethics advice. Um, I was a travel nurse until I had a stroke last year, and it knocked Ooh. me flat. Um, thank you. I am At this point, I'm physically able to work um, a half day, about two or three days a week, so praise God and healing. But wow. I still have a ways to go. Um, while I was travel nursing, I held my tithe aside in a separate account because I didn't have a home church. And you know, in the last number of months, I've just had back to back to back to back to back emergencies. So I've used up my six month emergency fund and I've used up my emergency fund, emergency fund. And um, now I have property taxes and a $640 prescription due next month. And I'm wondering about the ethics of dipping into that tithe account as a second emergency fund in this situation. Okay. All right. You have children? I do not. I am single and married. Okay. Cool. All right. Do you have a good relationship with your dad? Uh, yes, Good. they have already helped. Um, you know, okay. I wasn't, ask, I wasn't asking and... for that reason. I was asking for another reason. So, okay. Oh, okay. Here's okay. the thing. God is our Heavenly Father. Scripture is very clear on this. He's absolutely crazy about you. Just like your dad is. He thinks you're amazing. And he says to you, my daughter, the best way to live your life is to be generous. Generous people prosper. Generous people have better lives than selfish people. A baseline for the generosity is a tenth of your income going into your local church. Mm -hmm. Now, let's get this straight. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the hills. He does not need your money. And if his bride, the church, needs your money, then they are confused. Because their source is not you. Their source is God. So um, the ba the tithe is to get you into a rhythm of giving because giving is good for you. It's not an ethics or a moral question that makes you bad. It's like God says, if you eat donuts by the, by the box, you will get fat, my daughter. Don't eat them. That's what he said to me, by the way. Dave, don't eat donuts. You will get fat. Because when I can eat every donut in a 50-mile radius. But is God mad at me if I eat a donut? No. He just said, your best life is if you're generous and eat healthy and exercise every day. That's your best life. I know that. And um, my, my dad in heaven that loves me says that. And he loves you. And he's not worried about the tithe. So if you need to use this money to eat, you're going to be just fine. Don't ever give out of a sense of duty or out of a sense of legalism or rules. Give because it's the best way to live your life. Right now, the best way to live your life is pay your prescription bill. Is to live. <laughs> and to live your life. And you'll get back to giving soon enough. Okay. So lots of grace on the tithe. I'm a tither. I believe right. in tithing. I come from a I, I got I got saved. I met God in a tradition that teaches tithing. I, I teach it. I do believe it, but with absolutely zero legalism. Lots and lots of grace on it. Okay. That that gives me a lot of a lot more comfort. What Next, would your dad this? say if he gave you a hundred thousand dollars and he said, "Oh, you need to give ten thousand dollars of this to the church," and then you got your back up against the wall like you do right now? Would your dad be mad at you if you used that ten thousand dollars? Your dad loves you. He would not be mad at you. Thank you. That's I why really I asked, appreciate you yeah, walking me through that. That's why I asked you about your dad's relationship right there. Because this is your Heavenly Father. It's the same thing. 
And if I can see a healthy heaven, uh, earthly father smiling, how much more so our father in heaven? Amen. You're going to be okay. I'm sorry you've been through this. Thank yeah. you. Well, God's carried me this far, and now I understand the grace a little better that'll carry me through the next step. Yeah. And you, you'll get back to giving. You're going to end up giving a whole lot more than this amount of money through the course of your life above the tithe. So you'll make up the ground just because of who you are, aren't you? Thank you. You're yes, a nurse. So important to me. Yeah. We love you, darling. Thank you for calling. Sorry you had this year. Yeah, it's a tough year. Amazing. Dr. John Deloney, good show. Thank you, my man. Good hour. Good hour. Good job to the folks in the booth, James and Ben and Kelly. Well done. I am Dave Ramsey, your host, and we'll be back with you. Hey, it's Kelly, associate producer and phone screener for The Ramsey Show. If you would like to do your debt-free screen live on the show, make sure you visit theramseyshow.com and register. We would love for you to come to Nashville and tell Dave your story. This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where dad is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Got a special treat for you guys this half hour. We've uh, got one of our good friends on here who has a new best-selling book out called Hero on a Mission. Donald Miller is with us. Donald has written several best-selling books, starting all the way back to Blue Like Jazz and all the way up through Business Made Simple was the book before this one. And, of course, Story Brand, probably my favorite uh, business book by Donald Miller. And uh, this new one has done very, very well. We want to talk about it today. Welcome back, my brother. It's really great to be here. Good to have you. Good to have you. Hero on a Mission, a path to a meaningful life. It's really good. So uh, tell us about this. Now, I, I, when I saw the title, I know Story Brand. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I want to be a hero. Right, I right, want, right. In, in this classic story arc. Right. And uh, you talk a lot about storytelling in the other books that you've written and the, the power of story in marketing is what Story Brand is about. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I immediately thought, I kind of know where he's going with this. Hero. <laughs> hero. He's got a hero in the story. Right. And we're going to put him on a mission. This is good. Yeah. You know, I wrote the book really as an antidote to victim mentality. Oh. It, that's really what the book was because, or what it is, because, uh, you know, I mean, you know as well as I do, there, there just seems to be more and more victim mentality creeping into our culture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it's creeping into our culture, it's creeping into us. And I lost 10 years of my life because I saw myself as a victim in the story. This was in my 20s. Hmm. And was driven by moods, you know, w w thought that, uh, you know, other people had stuff that I couldn't get. There was something wrong with me. And some of that, you know, it, it, it comes from growing up hard and those kinds of things. But it, when I studied story in order to write the books I was writing, I started seeing these characters, the victim, the villain, the hero, the guide, the four major characters in stories. And I realized these characters exist in stories, not because they're out there, like that guy's a victim, that guy's a villain, that guy's... They exist in stories because all four characters actually exist in us. Mm -hmm. You know, when mm -hmm. I'm stuck in traffic, I, mm -hmm. I surface villain energy so fast. <laughs> <laughs> you and, can be the villain. And in, in the yeah. face of a Reese's peanut butter cup, I surface victim energy real quick. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so mm -hmm. on and so on. Of course, we're making light of this. But um, what I realized was the more I identify as a victim, the worse my life gets. Mm-hmm. And um, in other words, a victim thinks that they're doomed. A victim thinks that they are uniquely challenged in life and nobody else has hard days, but they do. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And it's truly, a lot of us actually could identify as victims because very hard things have happened to well, us. Well, sometimes we are so, a yeah, victim. Because an actual victim, you know, Henry Cloud, our friend, yeah. defines vic- a victim as somebody who has no way out. Yeah. And often, though, we really do. And so the more I see myself as saying, no, oh, I could choose to see myself as a victim well, there's a di- it's or like as a hero. Rochelle says, you're, you know, you're, there's a difference between becoming offended right. and living your life offended. That's right. There's a difference between being a victim of something. I've been the victim of something. I've been the victim of a guy T-boning my car. Hit right. me in the side. I did, didn't do anything wrong. I was the victim of that. Right. But then I don't choose to identify it permanently as, as a victim. somebody who is only victimized. I just was yeah. in a car wreck. Yeah. I was victimized there for a moment when he popped this out of my car, you know? Yeah. But I'm not a permanent victim. Uh, I just was well, a victim you know, of that here's moment. here's the other thing that happens, though. If you watch stories, heroes are always getting their cars T-boned and falling yeah. off buildings. and somebody's, The hero always yeah, has he- a moment where they're the victim. You pause any movie, and the hero is not having a good time. Yeah, there, there's a moment that they're being victimized. That's right. But they don't become a victim. They don't self-identify that way. And you, if you watch a movie, That's powerful. here's That's what great. happens to a victim at the end. They're rescued. They sit them on the back of the ambulance, put a blanket around them. And then the camera goes over and follows the hero. Because the story is not about the victim. The victim doesn't transform. They don't get rewarded. They don't end up blessed at the end of the day. They're a bit part in the story that does two things. Makes the hero look good and makes the villain look bad. And so when we choose to identify as a victim in our own stories, Dave, nothing good happens to us. It's very tempting, though, because we might attract resources. We get other people to do our work. We mm. attract some sympathy. There, there are coping mechanisms about being a victim that sometimes work. And it's one of the reasons I say, look, if, if you're playing the victim or if you identify yourself, don't actually be too judgmental on yourself. Because when you do that, you actually turn into the villain. And you can have a villain inside you that's judging the victim. I say, ignore them all. Start living like a hero on a mission. Start having some sort of ambition, face challenges as they come, transform into a better version of yourself, accomplish something you didn't think you could accomplish, and when you're done, you won't just have some rewards, you will have a new identity. And the more we spend time playing the hero, the less we're tempted by victim and villain mentality, and the better your life goes. Hmm. I always think about just roar. You know, it's like, you just throw back your head and roar, you know? <laughs> we, were, we, we were in Africa, you know, in the middle of the night, eight miles away, you can hear a lion roaring. The decibels are unbelievable. Yeah. But there's this, that's what the, the the hero does. They're not necessarily a predator, I don't mean that. But they, no, but the, they get the, up and they the hero face is the like, challenge. ah, we're going to do this, you know? Yeah. They rise up, throw their shoulders forward and lean into it, you know? Yeah. They, they don't shrink back and... Uh, try to find excuses, and, and I'm on a mission. Yeah, I got knocked down, but that's not my identity. I'm not the victim. And, uh, yeah, somebody said I'm a villain, and I like what Caroline Leaf, I wrote this down the other day. Dr. Caroline Leaf says, sometimes you will be the villain in someone else's narrative, and you need to be okay with this, but you're not responsible for their version. Well, they see you as a villain. Yeah. And sometimes people who call other somebody else a villain are actually the villains themselves. Yep. Because what they've done is they've diminished this person. They've labeled them mm-hmm. for one thing mm-hmm. that they did. They didn't have a nuanced understanding. And when you go to that person and say, I don't actually think that person's a villain. You look at this. They can't let go of the fact that you're a villain because the villain makes them self-righteous. Right. So they have to wrongly accuse somebody of being a villain in order to feel good themselves. And thus, well, what can- is that? cancel culture is that, born. That's exactly it. I literally just shared this on my podcast that's the other day. This is my born. problem with cancel culture, is that you are actually pretending to be a victim but but you're actually acting like a villain, canceling somebody else and diminishing them. And, you know, and sometimes people need to be reprimanded. Sometimes need, people need to publicly apologize. I'm not saying, you know, there, there's something. But to actually cancel somebody, to actually say, you should not have a voice in this society. You should be quiet. You should go away. In fact, you should, you should be marginalized from the community and starve to death. Is what they're saying. Yeah, that's a villainous thing to say about any about pretty much yeah. anybody. And so you know, why this book you got your this book attacks right? somebody. This book enlightens us. I think hopefully the goal of the book is to make us self-aware, so that we realize, oh, I'm playing the victim right now, and mm. this is not going to go anywhere good. Mm. Or I'm playing the villain. Uh, this is not going to go anywhere good. Yeah, it's always about somebody else when you're the victim or the villain. But well, they have agency over you. Yeah. The victim gives agency to somebody outside themselves who controls their moods, their life, and where their things go. The hero accepts their own agency to change things. Good stuff. More on this. We want to hear the rest of this. This is great. This is so empowering. Throw back your head and roar. It's Hero 
on a mission. Get it, where all great books are sold. It came out last week. Donald Miller is the author. With me for one more segment. Be sure you stay tuned. This is The Ramsey Show. If you're not using Pure Talk for your wireless, you're paying too much. Pure Talk gives you the same great 5G coverage on the same 5G network as one of the big guys for half the cost. The average family saves over $800 a year. Go to puretalk.com and choose the affordable plan that's right for you. With their 30-day risk-free guarantee, you have nothing to lose. Go to puretalk.com and enter the promo code RAMSEY to save 50% off your first month. book is Hero on a Mission by Donald Miller, A Path to a Meaningful Life. You want to get the book on Amazon or anywhere great books are sold. Anything Donald writes, I can promise you is worth reading. He's had multiple bestsellers. He's a world-class author and a good friend. We hang out together. Our wives like each other. And uh, we have uh, Donald's spoken at our events and um, pretty incredible. Okay, now I'm not sure I want to do this one. Start your day by reading your eulogy. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> I understand. But that's a little morbid. morbid. I mean, that's just, <laughs> golly, I feel like a victim right now. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do it almost every day. I uh, Four out of seven days. Okay. I, I This morning, I read my eulogy. Okay. Now, this is an old practice. Stephen Covey talked about it in Seven Habits. He, yeah. got, he got it from somebody else. It is a little morbid, to be brutally honest with you. But... What it does for me is it, it helps me start with the end in mind. When you write a story, normally screenwriters write with the climactic scene, mm -hmm. you know, the man and the woman get married, mm -hmm. and then they reverse engineer a story that gets them there. And one of the things that I do is I read my eulogy. There are three major stories in my life. I've got about 30 years left. <clears throat> That's it. In 30 years, I want to tell a great story as a family. I want to tell a great story in my career. And I want to tell a great story as a civilian uh, in the United States of America. I want to contribute three really good stories to those areas of my life. Now, because I read my eulogy, several things happen. One is I, a sense of urgency develops. I've got 30 years. You, you don't have time to mess around. You've got to get something on this. I, I call it putting something on the plot. Hmm. The other thing is reading my eulogy every day really helps me say no. Because if somebody comes to me and says, Don, you know, we'd love for you to, you know, try your, 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 your hat, throw your hat at a sitcom and be an actor or whatever. I don't have time for that. I have three stories left. There's no time to take amazing opportunities. I have three stories left if I want to have an impact in this world. And it really helps me understand. You know, Dave, you know our family well enough to know we just had a baby seven months ago, mm -hmm. Emmeline. Mm -hmm. uh, if I make it to 80, Emmeline's got me for 30 years. Mm -hmm. That's it. Now, I don't get any of that time back. So if I'm not constantly aware that this is a limited time experience here, I might be tempted to, you know, get too lost in my work to spend time with my daughter. So there, every morning reading my eulogy really helps set my story up for success. And, and let me define success, a meaningful experience to wake up every day and have a meaningful experience with life. It's not happy all the time. There's not always joy. Sometimes there's sacrifice. Sometimes there's suffering. But it's always meaningful. And by meaningful, what I really mean is I'm interested in my own story. My story is interesting enough that I'm not bored by it. I'm not restless. I think a lot of people... I'm not stuck. I'm not stuck. A lot of people hit midlife and they feel as though they're sitting in the theater of their mind watching an empty screen. Because the movie about their childhood is over. The movie about their college experience is over. The movie about falling in love and starting a family is over. And they never took personal agency to start another story. 
Yeah. So and what happens is a peripher- in their peripheral vision, a blonde and a convertible goes by, that's exactly and they have what it. we then call a midlife crisis. It, that's exactly it. And I think what midlife crisis actually is, is the failure to, to define a narrative that you can live within. Right. So The failure to have a story laid out. Sigmund Freud went around the world and said, look, the, the dominant motivation of mankind is to pursue pleasure. There was a guy named Viktor Frankl, who I talk about in this book, mm-hmm. created something called logotherapy. He said, Sigmund Freud is wrong. He said, the dominant desire of mankind is not pleasure, it's meaning. Mm-hmm. And when he cannot find meaning, he distracts himself with pleasure. Mm-hmm. If you don't define a story for your life and live into it, mm-hmm. you're going to go numb that pain somewhere, and you're going to get into all sorts of stupid decisions. Now, boredom equals Purchasing stuff you don't need, That's eating right. things you shouldn't eat. <laughs> That's right. And, and just keep adding to it. It's hedonism. It that, leads it, you into hedonism. That's and exactly it's, it. And, it's, uh, and it. And it is. And, and the irony of hedonism is it doesn't work. Right. It doesn't bring you joy. No, it doesn't fulfill you at all. It distracts you from the fact that you're not fulfilled temporarily. Powerful. Yeah. Powerful. Okay. The difference between someone who's stuck and someone found a path forward. They've defined a narrative for themselves. Same what we're talking about. Exactly. So if if there's you know there's basically three things I really want in life right now. One is a, a, a family, and we have a story that we're living as a family. It involves a little retreat center that you've been to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The other one is my company, and you know we're trying to right now we're trying to move into the college system, teach these young kids how to mm-hmm. be entrepreneurs. That's mm-hmm. that's a big story for me. Uh, and the third is a political thing that I want to get started about ten years from now. I really haven't put much on it right now. Those three story questions, will Don be able to be a great dad and a loving husband as he builds this sort of retreat center here in Nashville? Will Don be able to educate uh, the next generation of entrepreneurs uh, to to grow up and start companies? And will Don be able to to do this thing in the political sphere? Those are the three story questions in my life. Mm -hmm. And, And I ask myself those questions every day. What that does is it gives me narrative traction. And so to the listener, I say, is there a story question in your life that compels you forward? If there isn't, let me tell you who's dictating your story. Corporations, credit card companies, marketing agencies, uh, talk show hosts, Mm -hmm. hating on the government. Mm -hmm. There are people who are financially incentivized to get you to step into the story they're creating. But what about your story? Have you created a story for yourself? Do you have agency? Because I think it's a much better deal if you create the story for yourself and live into it. So I think that's what happens when uh, someone says, okay, I'm overwhelmed with debt. I'm mm-hmm. stuck. And when we put out there, hey, maybe your story is you change your family tree. Yep. Absolutely. And, uh, and not only that, but this, the, but the, you know, this is a, a story within your life. They, we would call it a subplot. Yeah. So here's the story. The money's of life. not the whole thing. There's your yeah. economic subplot. Right. There's your spiritual right. subplot. There's your love story, whatever. But wherever you're stuck, if you can rise above it and have some sense of nobility, then you become the hero instead of the victim. And I would actually argue, and I think Victor Frank would argue, that when you decide, hey, I'm $43,000 in debt, we're going to get out of this debt, it's going to take us about three years, and you live into that, and you focus, you overcome challenges, you know, you don't eat out, you do all this kind of stuff, you give it, you're actually entering into what Victor Frankl calls logotherapy, and that is a therapy of meaning. And a therapy of meaning happens when you have three things. One is an objective, something to try to do, something to try to build. Second is community. So if you're doing with this as a family, your whole community is bought in. It's actually bringing you closer to tackle this ambition together. And the third is a redemptive or optimistic perspective on suffering. Victor Frank would say suffering is inevitable. You're not going to get around it. Mm -hmm. But you can look at suffering and say, yeah, this is hard. This is painful. And also it's building character. Yeah. And also it's building discipline. And also it's giving me empathy. If you can have that sort of and also view on suffering, it actually creates a deep sense of meaning. And I discovered this about 10 or 12 years ago when I read Viktor Frankl's book and began to apply it to my life. And, you know, Dave, By the we, way, the book is called In Search of uh, Meaning. Man's Search for Man's Meaning. Search There's for another meaning. book called Yes to Life that's shorter and, and I think to some degree better. But, you know, I, I read that book and applied that to my life and have tried to spend the last 10 years writing it in a simplified language because he uses such clinical language. So here on a mission is my attempt to explain what Victor Frank was talking about. You know, for the last 10 years, there have been tragedy has struck our community. There's been sad days. There's been times when I've been angry. There's, there, but there's not been a single day when I haven't woken up interested in my own story. 
Mm. And when you wake up and you're not interested in your own story, Viktor Frankl calls it the existential vacuum. Mm. It's, it's what I call a narrative void. You have no story that you're living. You are a character wandering around without a plot, without a script, without a reason, and it's going to drive you crazy. Well, the stress of the quarantines and the stress Surfaced of the pandemic, of uh, it, well, it, it caught, people thought they were on a mission and then it was taken away from them. Yeah. And by, some people discovered shutdown. what was taken away from them was actually a distraction from meaning. Yeah. And they realized, I didn't like my life before. And so, so now things. we've got a huge number of people changing jobs. Changing jobs and transitioning and writing a new story for their lives. That's it. Good stuff. The book is Hero on a Mission by Donald Miller. He's a New York Times bestselling author. A Path to a Meaningful Life. Thanks for stopping by, my friend. Thanks, Dave. Good to have you. Be sure and check out anything Donald writes. It's uh, definitely worth the time. This is The Ramsey Show. If you're considering a career in technology, I recommend Bethel Tech, and I'm not alone. Here's what Brendan said. Before Bethel Tech, I was driving Uber. Within four months of graduating, I got a job paying $60,000. About two years after that, I got a remote job that pays me $130,000, all thanks to what I learned at Bethel Tech. You could be next. Get started today at BethelTech.net and get $1,000 to $2,500 off of your tuition. Again, it's BethelTech.net slash Ken Coleman. Solutions on the debt free stage. Dan and Lindsay are with us. Hey guys, how are you? Hey Dave. Yeah, better than we deserve. Amen. Welcome. Where do you guys live? Spring Valley, Wisconsin. We're about an hour east of the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Okay, welcome. Around Eau Claire then. Yeah. Oh, right yeah. Between there. You got Very it. Very good. Good, good. Welcome, welcome. Good to have you. Thank you. How much debt have you paid off? Four hundred twenty one thousand five hundred and eighteen dollars and nine cents. Wow! <laughs> how long did this take? Uh, three, three years and one month. Yeah. Wow. This is a lot. All right. Yep. And your range of income during that time? Uh, and we started the year before. We got to know you were about 150000 Last couple of years, we've been at about two hundred twenty. Whew. Man, you've been honking it. What do you all do for a living? We own a small business. We're a custom hardwood flooring contractor. Oh, okay. Nice times. Nice times. Yeah, it's yeah, been good. Definitely. Good times. We need some more competition. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or not. Uh, so uh, we, we can't help them all, Dave. <laughs> what, what, yeah, well, that's true. That's true. You need some help in the marketplace. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, uh, so the 422000 what kind of debt was this? It was business, our house. We had a car. Yeah. Just you paid off your home? Yes, sir. Sure did. Everything. You're 100% Everything. done. We don't own anybody anything. I'm looking at weird people. You are. Oh, woo Way to go, you guys. Very amazing. Thank you. So proud of you. Very well done. How old are you two? 34, and he's 33. Yeah. And you're 100% debt free. We sure yes, are. Sir. Business is making serious bank, has no debt on it. House is paid off. What's the house worth? About 370. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Way to go, you guys. Pretty amazing. Well Thank done. You. Okay, so um, you're making 150. Was that in the business? Yeah, that was the first year. Um, we had purchased the business that I worked in. Okay, and then you just mm-hmm. took off. Right. Uh, not only you you applied yourself to it, but also the weirdness of COVID made you high in demand. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, everyone's working from home and looking at their floors, thinking we need to do I something about get, it. I got to do something mm-hmm. with this ugly floor. Yeah, I got to do something with this. Yeah. A lot yeah. of buildings were empty, so gym floors weren't being used. 
commercial mm-hmm. buildings weren't being used, so we got hit hard with the commercial stuff right away. Yeah. Oh, but, yeah. Dropped off. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that makes sense. Oh, wow. So how did you how, how, how long have you guys been married? 13 years. Okay. So three years ago, 10 years into the marriage, mm-hmm. approximately, yep. you decide game on before yeah. COVID hits. Yep. Right. We're going we're gonna to take all this. We're going to get rid of this debt. Tell me the story. How did you get connected to Ramsey? What would you do? Well, it kind of started. We, we bought the business in 2017. Um, and then about a year into it. And before we bought the business, we didn't have any debt except our house. And we kind of always have been frugal. Kind of always yeah, been. Yeah, but really, that's not a much of a plan, though. Right. So, yeah. It was just a tight wad. That's about all it was. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, so we bought the business, and that consisted of four different lenders. Um, and then, of course, you buy a business, so you buy a car. Mm-hmm. That's just mm-hmm. next in the steps. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> right. So yeah. what are you into it? We looked Completely up. Completely logical. Right. right. <laughs> looked up and went from almost no debt to own everybody. Right. And debt is heavy. And it was really the emotional aspect that got it. We started looking at not only our employees, but their families as well, and just feeling responsible for that. Um, we weren't really struggling with money. Um, we, we were able to pay the bills and that obviously means you can afford it, right? Well, the emotional aspect is really what got us. And so mm-hmm. I, I still remember the actual job site that I was working on when I started searching for books or podcasts, something that was in that financial realm. Um, I found your Total Money Makeover book on Audible, listened to the sample, and then I listened to the rest of the book. Yep. <laughs> Came home, told her, said, hey, we're going to listen to this guy. And she kind of looked at me um, cause apparently she told me about you before. <laughs> about like, yeah, nine years before. Yeah. <laughs> sure no, did. no joke. I, it's, I'm I, so glad it's your <laughs> yeah. idea, Dan. Yeah, My idea well now, done. it's a good one. We're going to go with it. <laughs> yep. That's right. Yeah. Um, putting the kids to bed that night, I walked up the stairs and sure enough, we have a bookshelf from the top of the stairs. There you were. There your book was sitting. Laughing at me. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, it yeah. It was really just waiting for me, I guess. Was yeah, what he needed to find yeah. his why. When yep. the student is ready. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Oh, wow, you guys are amazing. So, okay, so now we're in agreement. Both of you mm-hmm. said we got this weight. We have this healthy disgust. Yeah. There's not really a crisis, just the weight of it. And so yeah. I don't like living like this. I feel like I'm out of control. I feel like yeah. I can't, you know, be responsible to my team and make sure they're mm-hmm. okay. Right. And then, boom, you start getting some information, lights you up, you get on the same page, and you go. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. That's right. Wow. And then we for you. really started looking that out. I mean, paying off the mortgage was something that was going to take us 30 years because that's what we thought it took. Mm-hmm. Then we started looking at the numbers, how much we were able to pay off this debt. Uh, the business side is really what pushed us. I, part of that was owning or uh, owing my old boss mm-hmm. money. It was partially mm-hmm. on our finance, so I wanted to get out from under there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then we started he, looking. He, wa- he wasn't mad about you paying him off no. either. No, no, he wasn't. Um, so we started looking at the numbers and how, how fast that was going. And then we were able to see, man, we can have our house paid off. Yeah, we could just keep going. So how much of the 422 was the business? How much of it was the house? It's about half and half. Okay. Yeah. So about 210 each. Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. Wow. Very cool. Good for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. You're 33 years old. <laughs> mm-hmm. You make $300,000, a year, and you have zero debt, house, or anything. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. How does that feel? It's amazing. Yeah, incredible. We had to get the house taken care of quick because winter was coming, and you can't walk in the yard in Wisconsin <laughs> in wintertime. <laughs> yes. We wanted to be able to appreciate our own lawn, so we had to do it. Have to walk through the backyard barefoot. The grass yeah. feels different. That's a Ramsey, sure Ramsey <laughs> saying for you newbies out there. And yeah, we're doing that in in, uh, in the winter in Wisconsin, it would be less than profitable. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I'm yep. with you on that. I, I could like frostbite or something. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow, way to go, you guys! All right, now this is a pretty impressive move here. I mean, you, this is a power move. Three years and one month, you pay off 422,000. You're living on nothing. Yeah, yeah. You, you are not buying a bunch of budget. equipment in the business. You're you're just running the business and you're running it wide open and you're working like a crazy man. How many hours a week a week were you working? Uh, I mean. Minimum of 12 hours a day, usually 15 to 18 hours. Um, a lot of what we do, we do a lot of staircase work, and so I was able to come home from our on-site work and sand and refinish stair treads and risers and in our wood shop. So I'd come home from work, eat and supper, work. Yeah. go back to work out in the wood shop, and um, yeah, 18 hours a day was a thing. So for two, three years you did yeah. this, mm-hmm. right? Just like a wild man. Yeah. So now yep. you can dial it back. Yep. Yeah. 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 You do need a dollar back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 The, you will live like no one else. Right. So later you can live like no one else. Yes, exactly. sir. Yeah. You pay a price to win and you did. And now we're going to live and give like no one else. You guys are incredible. So what do you tell people the key to getting out of debt is? 
I'd say find that contentment in the journey. If you're just sitting there looking at things like, I don't have this and I don't have that, you're not going to succeed. But if you can find that contentness, contentness inside that journey, you're going to go so far. Mm-hmm. I kind of have three things. First off, put God first in everything you do. Mm-hmm. And that's not just saying that's that's a, a real life. For real. Yeah. Yeah. Walk of life. And then for all you guys out there, go find yourself a virtuous woman. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Yeah, I'm thinking you're working 18-hour days, but she's got three kids. Yeah. She's working 20-hour yeah. days. Yeah. Part of that was homeschooled through COVID. Ho! Oh, doing all the yeah. books in the business. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. She mm-hmm. put in as many hours as you did yes, or more. Sir. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I noticed she didn't whine or roll her eyes when you're describing no. it either. No. Yeah, that's a big deal. I'm with you on this, yeah. all right? And then I'd have to say effort. Um, you know, there's really nothing special about us. Neither one of us have college degrees. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're what the society would call undereducated. Um, but understanding the power and the value in effort, um, that's really, you know, get up, get it done. And let me tell you, when you got Dave Ramsey, Jocko Willink, and Mike Rowe in your ear while you're at work, well, you just grab another cup of coffee, get back to work. Those three guys will give you no mercy <laughs> no, on hard work. Not. None <laughs> of us. None of the three of us will let you up, yeah. I'll just tell you. <laughs> Maybe we can sleep next week. Be like the three stooges right there, man. I'm <laughs> telling you, wow. And the good news is those are both really good guys. Yes, I'm sir. honored to be in their company, so good stuff. Very good stuff. Cool. All right, you brought the kiddos. What are their we names did. and ages? Let's get them into the shot. And we're going to give you a copy of the Baby Steps Millionaires, How Ordinary People Built Extraordinary Wealth, How You Can Too, because that's the next chapter in your story, to be millionaires. You are right on your way. What are their names and ages? Shaden is 11, Weston is 8, and Everly is 2. Perfect. $422,000 paid off three years in one month, making 150 to 220, 18-hour days. Count it down. Let's hear a debt-free scream. Three. Two, Two, one. one. We're We're debt free! Yeah! (laughs) What a great family. Oh, now they'll be able to do anything they want. They're only 33. This is the Ramsey Show. Hundreds of calls from people who are ready to start fresh and take control of their money. But without a plan, most of them never make progress, so they quit. Maybe you've been there too. But 2022 can be different. This year, you can win with money by following a plan that's worked for millions of people. We teach it to you in Financial Peace University. You'll learn a step-by-step how to save money, how to get out of debt, and how to build wealth Become a Baby Steps Millionaire and give generously. You can go through the class with other people or you can watch it online. Either way, Financial Peace University is available through a Ramsey Plus membership. This year, you can take control of your money for good. Start FPU for free by visiting for a free trial at RamseySolutions.com slash FPU. That's RamseySolutions.com slash FPU. Our question of the day comes from Blinds.com. They have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. That means even if you mismeasure or you pick the wrong color, they'll remake your window blinds for free. This is a great company. You get free samples, free shipping, and with the new promos they run every month, you'll save even more. Always use the magic word, the promo code RAMSEY. Blinds.com. Today's question is from Jamie in Texas. Dave, I just blew most of my $1,000 work bonus on my online gambling addiction. I know I did the dumbest thing possible, and I need help with this addiction. I've talked to my family about it, and they're extremely supportive, but now I've started lying about it, and I feel so much guilt. Please help me so I can refocus and stop gambling my hard-earned money away. Jamie, um... You have gotten caught up in the t- one of the two largest and fastest growing addictions in America today. Um, 
Number one, addiction in America today is online porn. Number two is gambling, and it includes sports betting. And sports betting right now in the height of fo- football season is completely over the top and out of control. If I see Caesar one more time, I'm going to shoot something. I'm so sick of these commercials, but they're making so much money off you people. You think those commercials are free? You know why that commercial runs on every break, people? Because they make so much money off you. So, Jamie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're struggling with this. It's a very harsh thing. The great news is you have recognized where you are, that you are addicted And I'm running into a lot of young men in their 20s and early 30s who are losing everything to gambling addiction right now. Uh, Personal friends, lost jobs, marriages, you know, my kids' personal friends. It's, it's, It's wild and it's really sad. So you're right to be concerned and scared and self aware about the guilt and the regret and the sense of no control. So what would I do if I found myself in that situation? Uh, I'm, I'm not sitting here with Dr. John Deloney at this moment, so I can't have him chime in as a professional counselor. But I can tell you as a guy who's been around addicts my whole life working with them, because 100% of addicts eventually end up broke. So we get to talk to them all the time. You have got to get some people and some processes in your corner to help you. And so if I woke up in your shoes, uh, I would go talk to my pastor and and start having a weekly lunch with him. I would get plugged into Gamblers Anonymous immediately. I would also call a therapist, a counselor, and start sitting down with a counselor daily, weekly, whatever it takes. Even if it costs some money, because this gambling thing is going to cost you everything if you don't break it. It is evil and it is vicious. It is merciless what it will do to you. It will beat the snot out of you and leave you on the side of the road for dead, dude. And so you have got to be very afraid of the power of this over you. So afraid that you take drastic changes and you don't worry about embarrassment. You tell everybody, I'm addicted. Help me. I'm addicted to this. Help me get out of it. Help me heal this addiction. Help me get away from it. Get in Gamblers Anonymous. Get with a one-on-one counselor. Get with your pastor. And lastly, get a group of friends in your life who will bust you, not the ones who are, you know, are saying it's okay. And your family, it sounds like when you say they're supportive, it sounds like they've been soft. If you were in my life, I would love you so much that you would feel it. I'm going to be all up in your stuff because I love you so much that that's what it's going to take. A, a, a pat on the back and a yay raw doesn't help when you're an addict. It takes more force than that to move people out of an addictive behavior and to move them into the help that they need to break an addictive behavior. And so it is not, a, it, it is not an act of love to be soft on an addict. It is quite the opposite. It's borderline enabling, if not full-on enabling. So, Jamie, I appreciate that your family is extremely supportive, but what extremely supportive should be is making you highly uncomfortable, not comfortable. And the way you're saying that, I kind of think they're going, oh, poor Jamie. You know, I'm going to bust Jamie is what I'm going to do because I love him. And I'm going to be all up in his stuff. And that's what it takes, man. You're not going to break something like this if you don't. Because the, there, there's a chemistry that goes with this. There's the endorphin release, the dopamine release, the high you get when you hit, when you actually win whatever it is you're gambling, whether you're bet, sports betting or whether you're playing cards or whether you're online gambling, whatever you're doing, you get a high on it. And it keeps you coming back. It keeps you coming back. And uh, that's, that's the addictive nature of it. And actually, we're addicted in that case to the chemicals in our own body. Um, but it's not out of your control. And you're not a victim to it, and you you don't have to be this way. You get to choose, but you've got to put some different people in your life. And your buddies you've been hanging out with that think this is cool, they're off limits. you got to stop it. If you have a drinking problem, you can't run around with your drinking buddies. And, and you're, otherwise, you're going to have a drinking problem. Duh! You become who you hang around with, man. You talk like them, you walk like them, you read like them, you go to church like them, and you treat your wife like them. You become who you hang around with. 
And, and so you've got to put some people in your life that are different than the ones that have been in your life that thought this was okay. And that's why I'm outlining like a pastor, GA, a good counselor, and you're going to write a check or two for some of this stuff. But it, again, it's going to be cheaper than the gambling addiction. This is the problem, the downside of the internet. The internet is not evil, but access to porn used to be, you used to have to go to a lot of effort to get to porn. Now three clicks and you're in. Four clicks and you're into stuff no human should ever see. The access that the internet gives you to betting, you know, it's to the point that it's like if you're not doing it, you're not cool because everybody's betting. And if you don't believe me, watch the commercials on every football game. Every commercial break is two betting commercials at least. This is tens of millions of dollars of ad revenue. Every night, every time you turn on a football game, they don't give those commercials away. Because, by the way, let me help you with this. Broadcast television has no one watching it anymore. Their ratings have evaporated. People watch on demand only. The only live television anyone is watching is the weather report on the local news and live sporting events. So the NFL ratings used to be the largest thing during the playoffs, and they would beat the best sitcom on CBS or the best movie of the week on NBC by a few ratings points. Now it's 10 and 20 and 30x because no one is watching that crap. If you've turned on broadcast television lately and you had to try to watch a movie and all the commercials keep interrupting you and you get pissed off, that means you haven't watched broadcast TV in a long time because that's the way it's always been. But you quit watching it and you started watching on Netflix, on Hulu. You started watching it and, and this access that it's given you is, is it's devastating, you guys. So the, the, the shift of the Internet on gambling addictive behaviors is very real. And some of you, that's your wake-up call, this little rant right here. And Jamie's little problem is a whole bunch of people's problem out there. It's an explosion of negative consequences and you guys have got to manage it for your own lives you're not a victim of it that puts this hour of the ramsey show in the books hey it's kelly associate producer and phone screener for the ramsey show if you would like to do your debt free screen live on the show make sure you visit the ramseyshow.com and register we would love for you to come to nashville and tell dave your story about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host on the week where Baby Steps Millionaires, the book, How Ordinary People Built Extraordinary Wealth and How You Can Too, becomes a number one bestseller on all the major lists. Um, it's a good idea that we do a millionaire theme hour, a Baby Steps Millionaire theme hour. Now, what's a millionaire theme hour? A millionaire theme hour, if you've never listened to one of these, is when I take calls only from real millionaires regardless of how you became a millionaire. If you inherited the money, you won the lotto, uh, you just signed an NFL contract. I don't care what it is that made you a millionaire. We, uh, you've worked hard for 58 million years. I don't care what it is. We want to hear your story if you're a millionaire. You call me right now. I want to teach people all through the Ramsey audience what a millionaire really sounds like and how they really got there by talking to real ones. The point is that we're not talking to people with an opinion. We're talking to people who did it. My old pastor used to say, a man with an experience is not at the mercy of a man with an opinion. 
So you're going to be talking to people with an experience. They really are millionaires. The phone number is 888-825-5225. Now, some people don't understand the real definition of a millionaire. There is only one definition of a millionaire. The definition of a millionaire is when you have a net worth of $1 million or more. Your net worth is calculated very simply by assets minus liabilities. Things you own minus debts you owe is your net worth. When your net worth is more than a million dollars, then and only then are you a millionaire. It is not you make a million dollars a year. It is not that you make a certain amount. Well, a million dollars isn't enough. It's not a moral construct. Evil, rich people are evil. It's not a moral construct. It's not a a million dollars isn't enough. We can discuss that. We can talk about that. But that doesn't matter. A millionaire is still a millionaire. Now, why does millionaire matter? Why does a net worth of a million dollars matter? Because it's your first major milestone in your wealth building journey. After you've gotten yourself out of debt so that you could actually start building some wealth, you become a millionaire first. Then you would be having a $5 million net worth, a $10 million net worth, or more. Some people never get past that, and that's fine. There's about 15 million millionaires in North America. Now, we've run into people who became millionaires with the baby steps, and that's why we call them baby steps millionaires. And this is a baby steps millionaire theme hour. Some of these people became millionaires while listening to this show, doing the things that I teach. Some of them didn't. They just became millionaires other ways, and that's fine, too. We want to hear from real millionaires to tell you folks what a real millionaire is. Eric is our first one. Uh, Eric is in Louisville, Kentucky. Eric, what is your net worth? Right at a million, Dave. Right there, man. All right, cool. And how old are you? 35 years old. Young guy. Good, man. Way to go. All right, give me a little breakdown on the million dollars, the mix on it. Yeah, so it's about 600000 uh, between uh, both my wife's uh, 401ks. Uh, we have another about 100000 and some IRAs. Um, and then 300000 in uh, some real estate or, or equity in our home. Right. And then about another 75000 um in cash. Good, good. Okay, cool. How much of this money did you inherit? Not a dime. Uh, just inherit some uh, great advice from both our parents, but uh, not a dime. Dave. Okay. And what has been your range of income, best year household income and worst year household income since you started your adult life? Yeah, since um, we started, uh, probably about right about fifty thousand, worked our way up to, uh, today to about one hundred and sixty. One hundred and sixty. Okay. What do you guys do for a living? Uh, we're both in sales and uh, consumer packaged good uh, industry. Okay. Cool. Both sales rep. Four year degree. Yeah, uh, mine was in a business marketing and supply chain, and my wife was in communication. Okay. What was your GPA? Um, mine said about 3.2, and I have to say my wife did beat me. She was at about 3.6. Okay, good. All right, good. Very good. Good deal. Okay, how much of this debt is, or, or this net worth is there because you borrowed money and it caused you to become wealthy? <laughs> uh, not a dime. Not a dime at all. Okay, so you didn't use nothing down real estate or something like that. You didn't borrow money to buy Bitcoin or something like that. <laughs> no, sir. Okay, cool. All right. So what do you tell the uh, 24-year-old that's watching you and me right now on YouTube, uh, the 23-year-old that says, how can, I be, uh, how can I be Eric when I grow up and I'm 35, 10 years from now? Well, what, do, what do they need to do? Yeah, a couple things that we live by. Uh, first is uh, get around someone that would teach you and not tell you. Um, uh, secondly, really run your own race uh, while living below your means. I mean, say that first one again. Life. Some th- get around people that will what? Oh, teach you and teach not you tell and you. Not tell you. Teach yes, you sir, and not I, tell you. Okay, all right, good. I heard it now. Yeah. Good. Yes, sir. Uh, second one, we uh, we always say just run your own race uh, while living below your means. Uh, a lot of times we see on social media, it's a great place for businesses and staying connected to friends and family. Uh, but a lot of times you see things uh, that simply people are doing that they can't afford. Uh, so we always make sure that we stay below our means, uh, our living means. And third, um, you know, get out of debt uh, and so you can really start investing early and often. You know, compound interest has been our best friend um, throughout our working career. Um, and then lastly, oh. 
You must have started your uh, 401ks in at what age? Uh, right, right, right at 22. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you got out of school, you took your job, you started the 401ks. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's what we were taught, and that's, it's, it's paid off. Yeah, 35 years old and you're a millionaire. Yeah. Yes, sir. And, ding, ding. And then, the, yep. And then the last thing we will always just say is, uh, you know, Philippians four nineteen says, "My God shall supply all, all your needs according to His riches." And uh, we we truly believe in giving. Um, my wife and I have uh, the last three years been through uh, countless of IBS and trying to have a baby, and during the process, we just continue to give and uh, trust in God. And and now we're having a baby uh, this coming March in a couple months. And, Wonderful. You know, it's all about giving, it's all about giving back and. And helping others along the way. We believe all that comes back tenfold. So, Amen. Yes, Amen. Are you guys TV people or book people? You read books or watch TV? Uh, I have to admit I'm the TV, but my wife's the book person. Okay. All right. What's the best book either one of you have read that's nonfiction and not a Dave Ramsey book in the last two years? Well, my New Year's, uh, my New Year's resolution was to do a little reading. So right now I just started The Tower Broke uh, by Damon John, actually. Oh, yeah. Okay. Damon's Become a Friend. That's a cool book. Good. Very good. Good stuff, man. Congratulations, Eric. All right. We're talking to real millionaires on a Baby Steps Millionaires theme hour. If you listen to these folks, you'll hear how they did it. The reason I'm doing this is so you can do it and so you can believe you can do it because you hear your story in theirs. This is The Ramsey Show. If you're looking for ways to update your home without blowing the budget, I've got it. For years, I've been telling you about our friends at Blinds.com. Blinds.com makes it simple to shop top quality blinds, shades, and interior shutters from home with easy online ordering and free shipping. With Blinds.com, there's no need to renovate your entire home. Just change out what's on your windows with upscale choices like faux wood blinds, cellular, and roller shades or even outdoor shades. Plus, Blinds.com guarantees the perfect fit. Whether you do it yourself or you have them measure and install everything for you. Shop their latest looks and see how much you can save at Blinds.com today. The easy and affordable way to make your home more beautiful is Blinds.com. to put 2021 behind us last year left a lot of people feeling burned out and sluggish a lot of us did a lot of whining i was on the list eeyore was our spirit animal right oh but 2022 is a fresh start it's our wake-up call we're going to be ready to own this year actually accomplish our goals you can make 2022 your best year ever and we're running our new year's sale right now and you can get 73 percent off our best-selling books assessments and envelopes includes the brand new book number one bestseller baby steps millionaires that'll show you the quickest right way to become a millionaire or if you're looking for a better way to manage your cash especially in categories that always blow up your budget like food pick up our essential cash envelope systems maybe you're having a hard time bouncing back from the last two wild years you can check out the best-selling quick read by dr john deloney redefining anxiety it's only 10 bucks right now all kinds of sales all kinds of good things all kinds of tools to help you check it all out at ramseysolutions.com in the store ramseysolutions.com in the store it's a millionaire a baby steps millionaire theme hour we're talking to real millionaires regardless of how they became a millionaire so you can hear what it sounds like to hit that first milestone 
of wealth building. Peggy is with us. Peggy's in Athens, Georgia. Hi, Peggy. What's your net worth? Our net worth is $1.3 million, and I have my husband, Jamie, here as well. He's just overhearing the conversation. Awesome. Well, congratulations, you guys. All right. How old are you? Um, I'm 54, and my husband is 45. Okay, cool. Now, give me a little breakdown of the mix of the $1.3 million net worth. What categories is it in? Uh, we have about 50% in Roth IRAs. So 650 in Roth. Mm-hmm. Okay. Nineteen uh, percent in TSPs, so about two hundred and forty-two. Okay. And thirty-one percent in cash. Okay. And so, what does that come out? About four hundred. Uh, yeah, four sixty-one. What about your house? Um. So we currently don't own a home. Oh, you don't. Okay. Uh, we All are right. camp. We're camp posting right now, but uh, we're actually in the process of purchasing. We just sold a house in West Virginia, moved back to Georgia. Ah, and, uh, that's why you're sitting on so much uh, cash. Yeah, okay. Yes. So how much <laughs> yes. of this $1.3 million did you guys inherit? Oh, that would be zero. Zero. And your best year household income since you got married and your worst year household income since you got married? Uh, worst year was the year we got married, so that would be about forty-four thousand. Mm-hmm. Best year was two thousand eight, was one hundred and fifty thousand. Cool. What do y'all do um, for a living? I did a. Well, we're retired now. We're both retired military. Uh, I retired from the Navy. He retired from the Army. Ah, well, thank you for your service. Either one of you have four-year degrees? Yes, we both do. Actually, I have two, and he has one. Okay, what's your degree in? Um. Information technology and accounting for me, mm-hmm. and wildlife management for my husband. Got it. And what were your GPAs? Uh, anywhere from 3.5 to 4.0. Okay. All right. Somewhere in there. All right. Good. Good. Okay. Cool. Thank you for your service. And I, I, now I know why that there's 200000 in that TSP. That was during the military time that you're putting money in that retirement plan. So Correct. good stuff. Very good stuff. Way to go. What do you tell you. the youngsters that are listening if they want to be you when they grow up? They're 25 or 30 years younger than you, and they're listening. You could talk to the young version of you out there just going into the military. Can they become <laughs> a millionaire? And if they can, how should they go about it? Absolutely, they can. Number one, don't buy the new car as soon as you graduate out of boot camp or the academies or however you get there. Um, budgeting, of course, is, is important. Um, as soon as you can start investing, grant, you know, determining being debt-free and stuff like that, um, the TSP now matches for uh, people coming in. So, you know, it's, a, it's a free money. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Cool. Good deal. So um, how does it make you feel when people say that there's no millionaires or there's no wealthy people unless they inherited their money? Well, we we know it can be done, um, but there, you know, there are a lot of naysayers and, you know, you try and explain the plan and say, hey, if you follow it, it works and you can be where we are just yeah. working the normal job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you never made a bazillion dollars. You didn't make $500,000 a year or something. You just saved money, mm-hmm. stayed out of debt, and worked a, yep. work, you know, you know, worked a plan. And, and did you have a good life yep. while you were doing all that, or did you just sacrifice only and have no fun? Well, we, we did sacrifice the first year we started this. I went to Iraq for a year, and that's where that huge bump in uh, money came from because the first year after I retired, I went and did that, and that – uh, jump started our debt free journey because by that at that point we weren't debt free yet. So you um, took so a civilian helped. contractor thing after retiring in Iraq. I did for yes. one year. What'd you make? That was the one fifty. Oh, about a hundred. Yeah, it was about a hundred thousand. Yeah. yeah, that was the year you all so. made a hundred and fifty though. Okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, way to go, so. kiddo! Very proud of you. Great job. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Danielle is next in Phoenix. Danielle, what's your net worth? Hi, Dave. Can Hi. you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, my net worth is one point three million. Good. Okay. Give me that a breakdown by category on that. Okay, retirement consists of three savings plan, a traditional Roth, 
a traditional IRA and a Roth IRA in the amount of four ninety four, four hundred ninety four thousand dollars. Okay. Um, I have a couple of brokerage accounts um, worth one hundred eighty seven thousand, and savings and checkings is five hundred seventy four thousand dollars. I just sold a house, so. Ah, okay, okay, and then that adds up to one point three. Good. How old are you? I am forty five years young. Good. Good. Are you married? No, sir. Okay. How much, I was. This, how much of this money did you inherit? Well, my husband passed away 10 years ago, so I, I inherited a house and um, his traditional um, IRA. So maybe a quarter of a million. I'm not sure if we call that an inheritance for this discussion right. or not. This okay. was just your, okay. as a couple, you had these assets. I mean, technically, I guess it's an inheritance, but it's not like you had a rich uncle that made you a millionaire. No, sir. Now, you and your husband were saving money. He passed away. You got, you know, you had combined assets. So, okay. What happened to him? Um, He had septus, like blood poisoning, wow. and um, he just had some bad, bad habits. Wow. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. So what is your best year of household income since you got out of school and your worst year of household income since you got out of school? I would say last year was my best, um, 116, and my worst would be when I first got out of college at 31,000. Okay. What do, you, what do you do for a living? I am a government um, worker, and I also am medically retired from the military. Okay. What, what do you do for the government? Um, I work with veterans. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Good work. All right. Yes, sir. And uh, what's your? do you have a four-year degree? I do. I do. What's it in? Psychology. Psych. Okay. And um, what was your GPA? <laughs> 2.91. I was a student athlete, so it was, it was tough. <laughs> okay. Cool. What, what sport did you play? I played basketball. Okay. For who? Um, University of Notre Dame. <laughs> All right. Big time. Big yes. time program. Yeah. Good for you. D1. Look at you. Yes, sir. That's fun. Fun. So uh, looking out and you're sitting and going back to your old high school and they tell you in that high school, oh, people from this neighborhood, they can't, they can't make it. And you're going to go on stage and tell them they can make it, right? Yes, sir. What do you tell them they need to do? I would tell them you can do anything that you put your mind to. Um, establish goals early on. At seven years old, I knew I wanted to go to the University of Notre Dame. If you can have someone else pay for your, your schooling, bachelor's degree, graduate degree, so you can come out owing no one, that's the quickest way to build wealth. Amen. Ding, ding. All right. We're talking to real millionaires. It's a Baby Steps Millionaires theme hour. Steps Millionaires theme hour. Too many people in America today are beating the drum that the wealthy are evil, that they are doing something wrong in order to become wealthy, that only crooked people become wealthy, or that the only way to become wealthy is to inherit your wealth, or that the wealthy are always famous people like entertainers or rock stars or athletes. Or that they're brilliant, that they have unusually high intellect, 4.2 GPAs. We did the largest study of millionaires ever done in North America. Airtight research. It was no confirmation bias. I defy you to find anything wrong with the research if you know anything about research. We brought in a research company. They combined with the folks on our Ramsey research team to make sure that it was airtight because we knew some of you 
that have a leftist socialist agenda in your brain wouldn't believe us, and you still won't believe us even though we can prove it. Because you've already made up your mind that you are going to believe a lie. The truth is that 79% of the millionaires in North America today inherited zero. Another 5% inherited a very small amount, not enough to help them become a millionaire, like their grandmother left them $5,000. Another 5% inherited substantial money after they were already millionaires. Five and five and 79 is 89 percent of America's millionaires are not millionaires because of an inheritance. That's nine out of 10. So when you tell people that wealth is all trapped in certain families, you are what's known as a liar. You have believed a lie. By definition, this is not an opinion. This is data. It's known as a fact. And when you tell people that all millionaires are unusually wealthy, are unusually brilliant, not a fact. The average GPA of the millionaires that we surveyed was right around 3.0. By the way, mine was 2.97, and I'm still pissed off about that three one-hundredths of a point. And when you tell people that all wealthy people are crooks, that just shows that all you are is jealous and envious. These are some of the seven deadly sins, if you ask my Catholic friends. If you live your life as a victim that is envious and jealous, you will never amount to anything. And so the point of the Millionaire Theme Hour, the point of doing the millionaire, National Millionaire Study, the point of the book we published by Chris Hogan called Everyday Millionaires, the point of a new book that I just did, Baby Steps Millionaires, about millionaires that followed the baby steps that I teach, all three of these pieces of information are very, very clear. They don't cancel each other out. They're not to replace each other. They are all solid pieces of information. We put the study, the white paper on the study, in the back of the Baby Steps Millionaire's book, so you would have it. And we show you mathematically, with facts, how you can do it. Why do we do all this? Because we have learned that if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Henry Ford said, If you really believe that the systems in America are so broken that people like you, whatever that means, can't get ahead, then you are believing a victim narrative fed to you by the people around you, and it's a lie. Because the real narrative, the real storyline is that you can become a millionaire in America today. Anthony proved it. He's in Washington, D.C. What's your net worth, Anthony? Uh, $2.6 million. Good for you. And break that down for me a little bit by category, please. How much in each category? Well, majority of it, uh, about 80% is in our retirement account. Okay, I don't need percentages. Uh, How much is that? Oh, uh, $2.1 million. Okay, $2.1 million in retirement. All right, and the other 500000 is in what? Uh, the four hundred thousand, uh, we have like three hundred thousand uh, value in our house, mm-hmm. and uh, another hundred and fifty thousand in outside investments, mm-hmm. and um, a small portion of cash for emergency funds. Gotcha. How old are you? Fifty-five. How much of this money did you inherit? All of none. <laughs> Zero. Okay. And what has Zero. been your, and during your working lifetime, what was your best year of household income and your worst year of household income? Well, well we started off uh, in 1991. We got married around 35 k mm-hmm. And it averaged out over the years to about a, over a little over 100 k Okay. Good. Good for you. All right. And what was your career? Uh, I was an IT specialist. And my wife is an Intel specialist. Oh, very good. Okay. And what is your four-year degree in? Uh, Computer science from Morgan State University. 
Good for you. Okay, what was your GPA? Uh, 3.07. <laughs> okay, very good. Right on there. Okay, yeah. so let me ask you this. Was anybody in your family millionaires before? Did, what made you think you could do this? Uh, nobody in my family was a millionaire. I didn't have any friends that were millionaires. Uh, the thing was, I liked finances, so I was interested in finances, but I constantly got myself in debt. Um, we used the house to help pay off debt and uh, took out money out of our 401k. So the thing that helped us was uh, Financial Peace University. So through Financial Peace University, we were able to you know, pay off all our debt with the snowball. We um, got on a zero-based budget and just started putting 50% to uh, retirement accounts. So right now we're on baby step five and six. Okay. They're showing you the pictures of your beautiful family on YouTube. And uh, so let me ask you this. Do you, uh, I want you to speak to the African-American community about this because I, I think there's a real narrative there that we, you and I need to tell the story that you can do this. Right. And that's one of the things. Um, you need to find people who are doing what you're doing. Um, and that one of the key things because, um, you know, and so that's what I, I kind of try to put myself around people who are trying to, you know, build their finances and get things correct. correct. I think the thing that for me, was that I didn't have a good roadmap. And that's what I think Financial Peace did. It gave you a good roadmap to avoid the pitfalls of life and kind of steer you in the right direction. And yeah. so I try to tell everybody, get on Financial Peace. Uh, I coordinate Financial Peace, and I've been doing it for the oh, last years. Oh, thank you. Years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I am sure that in your life of 55 years, you have faced racism. Yes. And you've yes, overcome that to have a $2.6 million net worth. Yes. Yeah. Because yes. I guess it just didn't define you. You just decided I'm going to do math because math is not racist. Correct. <laughs> it's not correct. Yeah. And, you know, you you overcome. I know you just got to overcome certain things. You know, you can't let that it define you or stop you from going where you want to go. Yeah. Amen. I'm so proud of you, man, and thank you for teaching financial peace. I'm honored to have you as a coordinator. You're an incredible, incredible man. Very, very well done, sir. You're an absolute hero for your family. You've changed everything in everyone's life around you by taking control of this. Very well done. That's what these millionaires do, people. They come from every walk of life and background. So you can, too. Our scripture of the day, Hebrews 6.19, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Albert Einstein said, learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow. The important thing is to not stop questioning. Baby Steps Millionaires is a number one best-selling book. Thank you, America. You did that. You bought it. We appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate our team and all the hard work they put on it. This is a Baby Steps Millionaires theme hour where we're talking to real millionaires. Adam is in Detroit. Adam, what is your net worth? Dave, it's $1.7 for myself and my wife. Excellent. And give me a little breakdown by category, please. How much in each category? So we have 50000 cash. We have $1.3 in the stock market, which would be mutual funds and index funds. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, we have 90,000 in 529s for our two kids. And then we have roughly 200,000 in real estate equity, which is split between our primary house and a small cottage. And then 100,000 in cars and miscellaneous assets. Good for you. How old are you? Uh, 38, and my wife is 40. Excellent. Very good. How much of this $1.7 million net worth did you inherit? Uh, none. Cool. And your range of income, your best year working and worst year working? Yep. So uh, starting in 2007 combined, we would have been roughly 60000 um, we've averaged over these last 15 years, 145,000 and our income has grown these last few years. So we're in the high two hundreds right now. Okay. All right. Cool. Good for you. All right. And what's your, in, uh, what, what's your career? Uh, so I, I work in commercial real estate and my wife is a social worker. Very good. And do you have a four year degree? I do. A bachelor's in finance, and then my wife has a bachelor's in psychology and a master's in social work. Good. And what was your GPA? So I did have a high GPA, so I was 3.97, um, and then my, my uh, wife was roughly 3.5. Okay, good for you. Well done. Good job, man. Good job. Thanks. So can this still be done? You're 38 years old. You're talking to a 20, uh, what, a 23-year-old, 15 years your junior. Um, can they still do it? Yeah, with without a doubt. I think there's more opportunities than ever to um, be an entrepreneur um, and really – Although I always did a good job of budgeting and staying out of debt, um, I woke up at 27, so about 12 years ago, and we had not saved anything for retirement. So I think the biggest keys, I think, is if you're going to be get married, marry a spouse that has the same financial mindset as you. It's just it's so critical to be on the same page. Um, don't purchase too much house. It's going to be the biggest purchase you make. And, uh, and that's going to drive how much you're able to save and invest and then maintain the same lifestyle as your income grows. That's probably been the the biggest driver in our wealth building is we still live in the same starter house that we bought 12 years ago. When you were making Uh, 60 and now you're making almost 300. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, way to go, Adam. Great job, man. That's how it's done. Ding, ding. 38-year-old millionaire. Uh, Jeremy's with us in Austin, Texas. Jeremy, what's your net worth? Uh, one point. Hi, Dave. Uh, 1.08, uh, oh so a million eighty-five thousand. Okay, good. Give me a little uh, breakdown by category. How much in each category? Sure. 815 in different mutual funds, Roth IRA, 401k. Uh, about fifty thousand in cash, uh, about two twenty in home equity. Good. All right. Good for you. How old are you? Fifty. All right. Good. And how much of this did you inherit? Oh, well, there was an inheritance day. That a thousand dollars. One thousand dollars. <laughs> Don't think you're a millionaire because of that. Okay. Right. All right. Excellent. And your range of income: best working year, worst year working year, household income. So I, I stumbled out of the starting gate in my 20s, so it was like 15000 starting out, mm-hmm. and now it is much closer to 200 last year. Good, good. What do you do for a living? I uh, work as an analyst in defense-related stuff. Okay. All right. And do you have a four-year degree? I do. I had a history degree, so... Uh, Liberal arts, you can still you can still get ahead in this country, even with liberal arts. All right, good. <laughs> and your GPA was what? Uh, three, two, undergrad. Okay. Good, good. All right. Well, if you're an analyst, you probably probably historical, uh, the history major gave you some perspective when you're doing some of your analyst work, right? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And it helped me in graduate school as well. So I do have a master's degree uh, as well. Okay, good for you. Way to go. All right, man. Excellent. Okay, can someone do this? Uh, you're 50 years old. Can someone who's 25 still become a millionaire? 
Absolutely, Dave. I think one of the worst things is the society's constant negative messaging that it's not possible for you. I mean, I grew up as a single parent in public housing and a Latino to boot and all of those things. Oh, you shouldn't be able to do it. It's possible. It's harder for some people than for others, no doubt. Um, We all have different obstacles, but it's possible. Uh, And uh, it drives me crazy when I hear that negative messaging that it's not. Mm. Mm. So what's your Latino heritage? Uh, Mexico. Okay. So you, your mom's a single Mexican lady raising kids. So, so dad and you're was one Latino, of them. mom Anglo. Do what now? Ma, uh, dad was Latino, mom Anglo. Oh, okay, okay, cool. All right, but mom raised you, and yeah. and as a single mom, and you come out of that household in that situation, and you're a millionaire at fifty. Yeah, I'm proud of you, man. Well done. It's a great American dream to control your own destiny. I'm so proud of you. Very, very well done. Okay, so. We had $1 million net worth, 1.3, 1.3, 2.6, 1.7, 1.1. 1. Precisely zero of them became millionaires because of an inheritance. They were 35, 54, 45, 55, 38, and 50. None of them were 80. None of them had a horrible life because they didn't do anything. They never had any fun. They stayed home and only went out on coupon, triple coupon Thursday and collected lint. It's, none of them did any of that. They all had good lives. They've all been saving steadily and got their house paid off. Standard. All these things fit the exact guidelines of what we found when we studied millionaires. And there's about 15 million of them, that, we, as best we can tell. I'm beginning to think there's more out there. Um. But listen, 38, 35 years old calling in. That's ridiculous, y'all. I mean, we used to say millionaires were reserved for somebody in their 60s. But you guys are doing this at record paces uh, because you're you're plugging into your 401ks. You're getting your houses paid off. You're avoiding debt. You're living on a plan. You're working together with your spouse, for those of you that are married. You're not using get-rich-quick you're using steady because get rich quick doesn't work. It, it, you don't end up rich when the story's over. That's the thing. It always ends up in, the, in a bad story. The end of the story is always negative. It's always sad. And we don't want you to be sad. We want you to win. If get rich quick worked, I'd tell you to do it. If, you, it was the, if it was the thing we found in the millionaire study that, hey, everybody in the millionaire study used Bitcoin, I would tell you to go get Bitcoin. If everybody in the study used nothing down real estate scams to go, go get rich and they, st- they remained rich throughout their whole lives and they didn't go broke from it, I would tell you to go do that. If they all bought gold, I would tell you to go buy gold. Did you hear anybody say they got rich on Bitcoin or gold today? There was open phones anybody can call that's a millionaire, but nobody did. Did you hear anybody say that they got rich b- but with the lottery? Then quit buying stupid lottery tickets. That's stupid. Come on. Think, people. Seriously. Do the stuff that works. That's why we put it right in front of you. We don't want you to mess up. We love you. We want you to win. We love you so much that we'll call you stupid when you're stupid. That's how much we love you. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace. And that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. Did you know you can listen to The Ramsey Show on your smart speaker? Just tell Alexa, Google Assistant, or Siri to play The Ramsey Show podcast. Check out all Ramsey Network shows on your smart speaker today.